Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, my name is Sean. I'm the Andrew W. Mellon Postdoctoral Curatorial Fellow at the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. And it's my um, great privilege to welcome you to the talk, Edmonia Lewis and Black Women's Activism in Civil War Boston, presented by Caitlin Beach. Caitlin Beach is Assistant Professor of Art History, Affiliated Faculty in African and African American Studies, and Interim Director of the Asian American Studies Program at Fordham University in New York City. She holds a PhD from Columbia and an AB from Bowdoin College, year of 2010. Um, her book, Sculpture at the Ends of Slavery, published by the University of California Press in 2022, was a recipient of the 35th Charles C. Eldridge a Prize for Distinguished Scholarship in American Art from the Smithsonian Museum and the Phillips Book Prize from the Phillips Collection and University of Maryland. Her work on this book was supported by the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Center for Advanced Studies in the Visual Arts, the Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art, the Smithsonian, the Decorative Arts Trust, and the Royal Academy of Arts. She's also a contributor to the M Metropolitan Museum of Arts exhibition publication, Fictions of Emancipation, uh, Jean-Baptiste Carpeau Recast, published in 2022. And her work has appeared in British Art Studies, 19th Century Art Worldwide, NCA, Journal of Contemporary Art, African Art, and the edited volume, Republican, Republics and Empires, American Art in Transnational Perspective, 1840 to 1970. This afternoon's talk is hosted by the BCMA in conjunction with the exhibition, The Book of Two Hemispheres, Uncle Tom's Cabin in the United States and Europe, which opened two weeks before, uh, la just the week before last, and will be on view through July 21st of this year. The exhibition highlights how fine art and visual culture serve to propel the fame both of the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and its author, Harriet Beecher Stowe, on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, in this sense, the exhibition shares many points of connection with Professor Beach's scholarly work, which examines the medium of sculpture's major role in the production and circulation of imagery centered on slavery and its abolition, both in the United States as well as Europe. Sculptor Edmonia Lewis and author Harriet Beecher Stowe were of course contemporaries and both achieved incredible renown during their lifetimes. Professor Beach's talk today will expound on and place Lewis at the center of this visual culture of abolition in which Uncle Tom's Cabin also played a role, but in different ways. Everyone here, I just wanted to also make sure to invite you to a reception in the BCMA entry pavilion following this talk. Um, and I encourage you, if you haven't already, to go see the exhibition in the Markel Gallery. But first, let me welcome Caitlin Beach. Hey, okay, so, oh, so the, the microphone, okay, great. So um, thank you so much, Sean, for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to come speak here. So thanks to everyone at the museum who helped um, organize this today and thank you all of you for coming. It's really great to see so many familiar faces in the audience. It's also very weird to stand here and not sit there. <laughs> so um, I'll do my best. So um, is the volume okay? Okay, great. Okay, so, so right. So um, sculpted objects, whether in the form of small handheld medallions or busts in marble or plaster, helped shore up connections within abolitionist networks of the 18th and 19th centuries. In one off-sided instance in 1788, the English potter and manufacturer Josiah Wedgwood sent a package containing several of his famed anti-slavery medallions to the Pennsylvania Society for the Abolition of Slavery, writing to Benjamin Franklin, the society's then president, that he hoped, quote, the subject of freedom will itself be more canvassed and better understood. And even as late as 1893, three decades after slavery's juridical abolition in the United States, 
The sculptor Anne Whitney commemorated the author and abolitionist Harriet Beecher Stowe with a plaster portrait bust. And as many of you know, both of these objects, along with many others, are on display next door in the very exciting exhibition, The Book of Two Hemispheres. The place of sculpture within anti-slavery networks is central to my presentation today, which focus on a set of works in plaster by Edmonia Lewis, a sculptor working between the United States and Italy during the second half of the 19th century. Between 1863 and 1865, Lewis modeled a series of plaster portrait medallions, statuettes, and busts from her Boston studio. Among the first works she created as an artist, they featured the likenesses of prominent people, including Abraham Lincoln, the abolitionists John Brown and Wendell Phillips, and two celebrated officers of the Civil War Regiment, the 54th Massachusetts Infantry, William Kearney and Robert Gould Shaw, the latter of whom you see here. These early works are little known, but they played a crucial role in Lewis's career. Scholars have discussed how the sculptor first sold them to a circle of abolitionist patrons in New England, and as a result was able to move to Italy and propel her career to international heights. Indeed, it was from her studio in Rome where she carved marble versions of the Shaw bust and the Phillips medallion in 1867 and 71 respectively. Both of these works hint at the form of their plaster prototypes, while at the same time raising questions about their initial production in the 1860s. And so my talk today revolves around the story of how Lewis's sculptures first circulated and the kinds of cultural work they performed in so doing. Lewis's sculptures enjoyed a wide purview in the 1860s. Period sources attest to their promotion in the abolitionist press, circulation at anti-slavery meetings, and exhibitions at soldiers' fairs. Few are known to survive today, which challenges our fuller understanding of their original significance. So I'd like to take this absence as a starting point to consider their efficacy as works of art mobilized in the project of wartime relief efforts. In Civil War era Boston, and at relief fairs in particular, Lewis's artistic practice unfolded amidst a sphere of black women's activism centered towards the aid of African-American soldiers, their families, refugees of war, and the formerly enslaved. I'll argue that the praxis of making and the poetics of plaster specifically were central to this project. Executed in a medium evocative of both the provisional and the curative, Lewis's work proposed one way of shaping the terms of relief work in the material world. So while the, plasters, while the sculpture's plaster materiality likely factors into their absence today, it was paradoxically central to their meaning circa 1864. To lay foundations for understanding Lewis's work, I'll speak first to her early life in upstate New York, where she was born and raised, and in Ohio, where she studied. Her experiences and education in both of these places helped shape the kinds of projects she would later undertake as an artist, as well as the publics in which it would circulate. Lewis, shown here, was born in the town of Greenbush, New York, near Albany in 1844. Of Afro-Haitian and Native American descent, she was raised in the care of her mother's sisters on Anishinaabe homelands by Niagara Falls. And during these years, she made and sold with her aunts baskets and embroidered moccasins for the fast-growing souvenir trade between indigenous makers and Anglo consumers in the Great Lakes region. And this was a formative moment. In interviews given later on in her career, Lewis mentioned her time with her aunts and also made allusions to such handcrafted objects in a variety of her works, including The Old Arrow Maker, a sculpture based on the popular poem, The Song of Hiawatha, which featured the protagonist, Minnehaha, seated alongside her father, wearing embroidered deer hide moccasins and carefully twining a mat in her lap. And as the scholars and basket weavers Kelly Church and Cherish Parish have recently pointed out, The Old Arrow Maker, though on the one hand based on a fictionalized poem, also resonates strongly with the Anishinaabe artistic practices in the ways that it presents a female figure as a maker and keeper of cultural traditions between generations. As we'll soon see, Lewis's early experiences with a woman-led sphere of art and entrepreneurship not only found form in the subjects of her sculpture, but also bore distinct parallels to the women-run relief projects uh, that she would later participate in in Civil War era Boston. 
And the definitions of womanhood that Lewis encountered in her studies, however, differed from those she experienced before in her youth that I've just talked about. In the 1850s and early 1860s, at the behest of a wealthy older, older brother, she left Niagara Falls to attend New York Central College and then Oberlin in Ohio, where she enrolled in what was called the college's Young Ladies Preparatory Department. Both of these institutions were distinctive to 19th century American education. They were founded by social reformers and abolitionists in the name of progressive ideals and supported the enrollment of students regardless of race or gender, welcoming what was for the era significant numbers of free black students such as Lewis, as well as students who had formerly been enslaved. Yet it's important to note that the ideologies of reform they espouse unfolded differently in reality. In her important study of Lewis's work, the art historian Kirsten Pye Buick discusses the ways a college like Oberlin did not safeguard against an environment in which students of color and women of color especially were subject to racism. And Lewis herself was the victim of several incidents of racial violence that ultimately culminated in her departure from the college before graduation. In spite of its liberal mission, as Buick notes, Oberlin's pedagogical vision in the 19th century was ultimately beholden to a patriarchal white supremacy with the core aim of educating female students so that they might better navigate the domestic sphere as mothers, teachers, and caregivers. But amidst these institutional limitations, the college and surrounding town of Oberlin still remained an important nexus of anti-slavery activism, which would be crucial to Lewis's time there as well as in the years to follow. There she met William Lloyd Garrison, who edited the influential anti-slavery newspaper, The Liberator, whose prominence in Boston would later facilitate important links to the abolitionist press in the art world. It was also at the college where Lewis made a series of connections with fellow students who would later become central to her professional and social circles, including the attorney and educator Richard, Green Richard Greener, who you see at center, who is an early collector, collector of works by Lewis. And in short, in Ohio, Lewis forged ties with communities of intellectuals and anti-slavery advocates activists whose support helped shape her work in significant ways. As Frederick Douglass later recounted of a chance encounter during a visit to Oberlin in 1863, we remember conversing most earnestly and encouragingly with Lewis, then a student, with regard to art. She had exhibited some signs of talent in drawing and painting, had evinced such enthusiasm for the art that we were then led to advise her to seek the East, uh, meaning uh, Boston and by study, prepare herself for work and further study abroad. Douglas's mention of Lewis's artistic talent is expressed in a graphite drawing she completed while still at Oberlin, in which she shows the Greek muse of astronomy, Urania, swathed in drapery and holding in her hands the classical attributes of a pointing rod and celestial orb. Urania here appears strikingly sculptural with undefined pupils and a body defined by a smooth polished surface and a sense of three-dimensional heft. Some forms are enclosed with deliberate and steady lines while others swell and fall through passages of subtle shading as seen in the drapery that cascades in the foreground. And while it's likely that Lewis produced the sketch after studies of an antique Roman statue reproduced as either a plaster cast or in a printed engraving, this is neither a simple copy nor static form. She notably depicts Urania in three quarters view, an angle that makes it appear as though the muse herself is perhaps sculpting the orb as the rod limbs its curved surface. And as such, it prefigures what we'll later see as a defining aspect of Lewis's practice, in which she pushes beyond a neoclassical paradigm to imbue her figures with a sense of liveliness and decisive action. I now want to shift our attention to the beginnings of Lewis's career as an artist in Boston, focusing in particular on the ways her work intersected the networks of abolitionism that we've just begun to discuss. Lewis left Oberlin for Boston in mid-1863 and quickly immersed herself in the city's artistic circles upon her arrival. It was, as she would note in 1864, the quote, best place for me to learn to be a sculptor, end quote. After gaining foundations in the medium under the tutelage of the artist Edward Augustus Brackett, Lewis established her practice in room number 89 of the newly established studio building that you see here, which was a lively nexus of sculptors, painters, and photographers 
that was regarded in its day as a, quote, perfect hive of artists. In addition to artists, the studio building was also home to the New England's Freedmen's Aid Society, which had been recently established to support former Bonds people. And Lewis would go on to forge a close association with this society as well over the course of the 1860s. They promoted her work regularly, and after the end of the Civil War, she traveled to Virginia under their auspices to work as a teacher of formerly enslaved children in the South. And it was in this context in late 1863 that Lewis conceived of her first recorded sculpture, a plaster medallion of John Brown, the white abolitionist who raided a federal arsenal in Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, with the intent of launching an armed slave rebellion. As noted by newspapers at the time, she modeled the medallion after a plaster bust of Brown completed by her former teacher Brackett in 1860. Though, known, no, though no known copies of this work survive, Brackett's busts, as well as a bust of Brown that Lewis executed over a decade later, offer possible indications to its appearance. The former had completed his sculpture following a meeting with the abolitionist as he awaited trial for his Harper's Ferry raid. And in the bust, as you can see, Brackett duly emphasized Brown's deep set eyes, sharply furrowed brow, and forked beard, making for a portrait that many recalled, that for many recalled the forbidding presence of Michelangelo's Moses. In Lewis's later, of sculpture, later sculpture of Brown that you see on the right, likewise teems with intensity, suffused too with a sense of contemporaneity, owing to the fact that she depicted Brown in period dress rather than in the bare-chested neoclassical manner, as did Brackett. He gazes rightward with a piercing expression accentuated by hollowed cheeks and wildly flowing hair. Given its similarities to Brackett's bust, it likely, it's likely she drew upon the memory of her early medallion in modeling the plaster of 1876. Lewis's choice to depict Brown speaks to her engagement with anti-slavery politics by way of her sculptural practice. Her strategic promotion of the work further attests to this. Weekly newspaper notices from the period revealed that she distributed, distributed medallions for display and sale at the American Anti-Slavery Society in Boston, as well as the publishing offices of Robert Hamilton's weekly Anglo-African newspaper in New York. In these contexts, Lewis's John Brown medallion was promoted as a small-scale, affordable object for display in the home. We might imagine it occupying what Jasmine Nicole Cobb has elsewhere termed the transatlantic parlor, or a sentimental, physical, and domestic space that gave form to new visions of black freedom in the late 19th century. Small sculpted medallions had, of course, long been mobilized in concert with abolitionist discourse. We can recall Josiah Wedgwood's anti-slavery cameo of the 1780s, reproduced widely in the British Atlantic in order to mobilize support for campaigns to abolish the transatlantic slave trade. But what did it mean to pursue these efforts in 1863, at a moment when the promise of emancipation in the United States depended increasingly upon the contingencies of the American Civil War? The Emancipation Proclamation had gone into effect on the first of the year in 1863, but had limited purchase as a military provision that did not free all those enslaved. It nevertheless spurred action. As the liberator observed a day after the proclamation's issue, the abolitionists will therefore increase, not relax, their efforts, end quote. And if many black abolitionists had previously withheld full support for a conflict waged by a federal government, uh, that, uh, I'm sorry, for, conf for a conflict waged by the federal government, the projects to eradicate slavery and support the Union be became increasingly intertwined as the aims of the war moved more clearly towards emancipation. In one area that united both of these interests was the effort to enlist and support African American regiments. We can understand Lewis's work over the course of 1864 as part and parcel of this enterprise were in support for black soldiers fighting in the war translated into support for abolition and vice versa. After completing her medallion of John Brown, Lewis modeled two small plasters depicting officers of the 54th Massachusetts Infantry, one of the war's first African-American regiments. The first statue she completed was a tabletop statuette depicting one of the unit's celebrated black officers, Sergeant William H. Kearney and the second was a bust of the regiment's white commander, Colonel Robert Gold Shaw. Shaw had been killed as the regiment led a Union assault on a Confederate fort in July of 1863, and Kearney, wounded, rushed forward to carry on the charge. 
And like the Brown Medallion, both of these works circulated amid abolitionist networks. And they also appeared at soldiers' fairs, where they were marketed alongside other goods and handicrafts. Neither is known to survive, to, uh, to survive today, likely because of this very context of consumption. But the circulation of both reveals a great deal about the social and political work of sculpture in wartime Boston. Lewis's bust of Shaw appeared across a variety of spaces and media. It was displayed at the fairs mentioned above, with the late officer's family pleased with what they considered a, quote, excellent likeness of their son. The Shaw family then collaborated with Lewis to reproduce the bust in multiple formats, including the creation of 100 plaster casts taken from the original, as well as carte de visite of the work made by the local photographer, Augustus Marshall. Finally, several years later, one of Shaw's sisters commissioned Lewis to produce the marble version that you see here, which she produced in Rome in 1867, adding an inscription that had not been present in the earlier plasters, Martyr for Freedom, carved in the block letters on the bus's rounded base. So you see that just here. Shaw's martyrdom, so pro prominently declared on the marble version of the bust, was embedded in a complex web of narratives constructed around the bodies of both artist and subject depicted. If many white male sculptors of the 19th century depicted black female subjects in their works, Lewis's Shaw represented a radical inversion to this norm. Period commentaries acknowledge this in patronizing terms, with newspapers including the Boston Evening Transcript and the Liberator running stories that speculating that Lewis had undertaken the bust, quote, out of a grateful feeling of what he had done for her race, end quote, at once erasing her indigeneity and sublimating her blackness into an essentializing condition of indebtedness. Accounts, to, to, uh, accounts such as these speak to the ways Lewis's work was historically understood as a reductive expression of identity, rather than the artist's own nuanced negotiation of the expectations and demands of her diverse audiences. We would do better to think of Lewis's Shaw bus in strategic terms, a response to a world in which white Bostonians preferred to lionize the colonel who looked like them rather than the soldiers who did not. If the, if the organization of the 54th Massachusetts Infantry itself replicated dominant racial hierarchies of the day with high-ranking white commanders in charge of non-commissioned black officers and infantrymen, so too did many of the ways in which the regiment was rem remembered. For his famous 1897 memorial to the unit on Boston Common, Augustus St. Gaudens cast a monumental bronze panel that foregrounded Shaw on horseback in relief so high it was nearly in the round, while black infantrymen march on in foot behind him in freeze-like formation with their forward motion arrested by rigid marble columns on either side. And three decades later, it was the Shaw family who chose to replicate only the bust of their son, which the sculptor was reportedly permitted to, quote, sell for her own benefit at $15 a piece, and not Lewis's early statu earlier statuette of his black comrade, William Carney. From what I've just discussed, it appears at first glance that Lewis's Shaw bust was afforded more visibility than her statuette of Carney. Though she conceived of and modeled the Carney sculpture prior to that of Shaw's, it was the latter that gained outsized attention in wartime Boston for the ways it aligned with its accepted narratives about Lewis's and Shaw's racial subjectivities. It was through her display and reproduction of the Shaw bust, as we have seen, that white Bostonians commemorated the legacy of one of the war's first African-American regiments by way of the body of its white colonel. But the exhibition of the Kearney statuette opened onto a different set of practices directly connected to the welfare of the unit's black soldiers and their families. In order to better understand this cultural work, it's first necessary to return to both of the sculptures themselves. Period accounts and images offer context to the original plasters that Lewis modeled of Carney and Shaw, despite the fact that both, both have been lost to time. The statue of Carney reportedly showed the officer in the melee of battle, perhaps had, as he had been depicted in a popular Courier and Ives lithograph, wielding the regiment's flag and leading fellow soldiers on at the apex of the prince composition. The only clue to its appearance comes from a correspondent for the newspaper, The Weekly Anglo-African, who described the figure poised in, quote, a kneeling attitude holding up the colors lest they touch the ground. The plaster Shaw also remains unlocated, but Lewis's later marble, as well as period photographs of the original plaster, 
taken from different angles, offer insight to what it looked like in the round. Shaw tilts his head with this expressiveness accentuated by gentle contours around his eyes and slightly parted lips. If the squarely furled brow, set mouth, and frontality of the later bust lend a monumentality to the marble Shaw, the nuances of the earlier plaster show a figure who appears alert and concerned. And even from our limited de description of the Carney statuette, it's possible to see how Lewis imparted to both of her sculptures an impression of action and liveliness, however pronounced. We can think of in the description that says in a kneeling attitude holding up the colors, or we can think of the subtle um, details of the Shaw sculptor, what, sculpture with a tilted chin and an opened mouth. And we'll recall Lewis's interest in presenting a lively figure with her drawing of Urania. And additionally, it was not uncommon for sculptors of this period to infuse small works like busts and tabletop statuettes with an approachable narrative. John Rogers did, show with, did so with his popular genre groups, and Lewis too would go on to emphasize tableau-like settings with statues such as the old arrow maker, where the figures of Minnehaha and her father rise from their handiwork to meet the gaze of Minnehaha's love Hiawatha. Significantly, small-scale tabletop works such as these were often made with an eye to sentimental markets in reform-minded contexts like fundraising fairs, where they might punctuate social affiliations and common causes. The Carney statuette and the Shaw bust functioned in this way, as Lewis displayed both at Boston Soldiers' Fairs held in the fall of 1864. The statuette made its debut at an event called the Colored Ladies Sanitary Fair in October, and the bust at one called the National Sailors Fair a month later, with each sold to benefit wartime relief efforts. These fairs, and the Colored Ladies Sanitary Fair in particular, are important because they ask us to remap the coordinates of Lewis's work within a network of black women's entrepreneurship and activism, rather than the circles of white Boston abolitionists with whom she's been more frequently associated. Scholars often situate Lewis's artistic labor in relation to white women whether patrons like Lydia Maria Child or fellow sculptors like Harriet Hosmer and Anne Whitney. But attention to her involvement in a world of fairs opens onto another circle of actors that comprise primarily women of color, engaging with the literary scholar Cortha Mitchell has termed a homemade citizenship, or what the historian Martha S. Jones calls war work, or relief projects such as mutual aid and institution building. As Jones has argued in her study of 19th century black women's activism, War work presented one venue through which some women could stake claims to new forms of public belonging and public culture in 1860s America. To work for the war, she writes, was to claim freedom and citizenship. Moreover, as Lewis's participation in fairs will bear out, the spheres of war work and of creative production were by no means mutually exclusive. In the space of the Soldiers' Relief Fair, the act of making took on associations at once therapeutic and political, working as a means through which bodies and collectives could be made, remade, and imagined anew. The Colored Ladies Sanitary Fair of October 1864, where Lewis exhibited her statuette of Kearney, stemmed from the efforts of the Massachusetts Colored Ladies Sanitary Commission, an organization run by the Boston hairdresser and entrepreneur, Christiana Carto Bannister, whose spouse, the painter Edward Mistral Bannister, had a studio neighboring Lewis's. There's much to say here, but what's crucial is that much of the Sanitary Commission's work unfolded in response to the government's failure to fully compensate or equip black regiments. The fair was held to redress this, with the commission declaring it, quote, the most practical method of accomplishing their object of furnishing aid to soldiers, their families, and children orphaned by war. Broadsides like the ones you see here, detailing these objectives were printed, and the press highlighted efforts to work for the benefit of, quote, colored soldiers in the place of a government that had treated them so cruelly, end quote. The relief fair was not merely a patriotic gesture, but one of the few viable strategies of sustenance in the absence of institutional supports proffered by the nation state. In the central attraction of the Colored Lady Sanitary Fair was its extensive display of goods. Coverage of the event, which came primarily from black newspapers around the country, gives insight into what the weekly Anglo-African proclaimed the greatest fair ever held in Massachusetts. Boston's Mercantile Hall, a building with strong associations to reform movements as a place for abolition and suffrage meetings, 
was festooned with greenery, banners and flags, and tables stood laden with wares. Many of these wares were handcrafted, with Lewis's sculptures appearing alongside furniture, textiles, samples of lace, and myriad other, quote, fancy articles. No known images of the Boston Fair survive, but illustrations of other fairs held in the Northeast in the same year can offer us a sense of their atmosphere and the kinds of goods on offer. In the engraving after Winslow Homer, we see women selling bouquets of handmade paper flowers to crowds of fairgoers and soldiers. And handicrafts were not uncommon objects at relief fairs. Indeed, they were the mainstays of such events. And while the fairs themselves in many ways replicated capitalist structures as fundraising projects, their centering of the handmade and the handcrafted, as opposed to the mass produced or industrially manufactured, made space for what Stephen Knott sees as a, quote, spatial temporal zone in which capitalist structures can be stretched, quietly subverted, and exaggerated, end quote. To this point, it's worth emphasizing how the ethos of handiwork conveyed not only women's domestic gentility, but moreover their industriousness. Consider Sojourner Truth's famous carte de visite from the same moment, in which the activist appears before the camera as a dexterous maker with yarn and knitting needles in hand. The art historian Darcy Grimaldo Grigsby has written of the centrality of craft to Truth's carefully self-fashioned images, noting that knitting was a form of labor, exertion undertaken as a patriotic duty, not a genteel hobby. In other words, handmade objects could say a great deal about the seriousness of women's war work. The plaster works Lewis exhibited at soldiers fairs commanded unique associations with the handmade, perhaps more so than an oil painting or a marble sculpture. With their small scale and associations to the domestic sphere, tabletop sculptures invite a sense of close and intimate engagement. And the variegated surfaces of plaster, works in particular, frequently bear the tactile traces of the sculptor's hand. Marks from a modeling tool, the tiny grooves and speckles to accumulate as the material is exposed to air, or rough passages smoothed out by quickly working fingers. Moreover, the association between plaster, hands, and handicraft was not uncommon in 19th century sculpture. Harriet Hosmer produced a plaster life cost of the clasped hands of her friends Robert and Elizabeth Barrett Browning as a meditation on making and touch, and Hiram Powers routinely cast the hands of his young daughter Louisa as studies for larger scale works. Although plaster sculpture is often dismissed as a mere preliminary study to more permanent works in marble and bronze, in the Victorian era, plaster evoked the haptic potency of the sculptor's touch. Plaster could also heal in the most literal of senses, and this was not an association lost on viewers attending a fair for the relief of soldiers. Physicians in 19th century hospitals often mixed the powdery gypsum-based compound with water to set bandages and immortalize limbs. And indeed, earlier in the 1850s, a Crimean War surgeon introduced the, the use of plaster splints in field hospitals after having seen a sculptor at work in his studio. Civil War doctors also made liberal use of the material to treat fractures and sprains, as you see here in the surgeon's field guide. In looking back on her time as a wartime nurse, Louisa May Alcott recalled seeing a man's wound, quote, held together with straps of transparent plaster, which I never see without a shiver, in swift recollections of the scenes with which it is associated in my mind. Here, reading Alcott's words, we're reminded of what the liter literary scholar Elaine Scarry has written of wounds. She argues that they are unstable reference, reference that can open on to infinite constellations of symbolism. What Alcott's passage presents, then, is an identification of a plaster-bound wound with healing on one hand and the recollections of war on the other. Circa 1864, the tactile materiality of plaster hovered at the boundaries of the making and unmaking of the world, and presented a possibility to reconcile one with the other. Put another way, as Johann Gottfried Herder wrote in his famous treatise on sculpture, touch alone reveals bodies. The relationship between plaster and the making of bodies both sculptural and real coalesced with Lewis's statuette of William Carney. Recall again the weekly Anglo-African's description of the figure as he, quote, appeared in a kneeling attitude holding up the colors lest they touch the ground. This description is brief and enigmatic, but what it does tell us, it is clear that Carney's body is whole, 
and scholars have rightfully singled out the statuette as Lewis's first recorded full-length figure. As such, it presented a distinct departure from another contemporary small sculpture, John Quincy Adams Ward's Freedman, which depicted an anonymous black man with broken manacles at his wrists. Ward's statuette also debuted, debuted during the war at the National Academy of Design in 1863 and was later cast into bronze. The figure embodies a state of liminality as he twists his body upward and outward from a seated earthbound pose. By contrast, Lewis's Carney statuette hinged on the representation of a decisive action and specific actor. If Ward's work presented a nameless figure as an embodiment of a generic type, the freedman, much like other representations of black figures in West Western sculpture, Lewis's statue presented one of the earliest ruptures to this tradition in the depiction of a black man as a named individual connected to a specific historical event. In Lewis's depiction to depict Carney in the action of battle bore deeper resonance beyond mere fidelity to historical narrative. Kearney had been gravely wounded while struggling to save the regiment's all-important flags, a symbolic act for which he was later lauded back home. It was, significantly, the Colored Ladies Relief Society that furnished and presented the regiment with these flags upon their incorporation in 1863, in a fundraising campaign that was spearheaded by a woman named Adeline Howard, who was, incidentally, a good friend of Lewis's, the two would later go on to travel to Virginia to teach freedmen at the war's end. And although Lewis had yet to arrive in Boston at the moment of the making and presentation of these flags, her display of the Carney plaster at the Colored Ladies Sanitary Fair one year later perhaps reminded viewers that black women's circles of making and relief had long been central to the regiment. An additional contemporary image underscores this idea. In 1864, Kearney posed for a photograph with the battle-worn flag he had famously wielded in the war, holding it with one hand while steadying himself with a cane in the other. The voluminous standard bisects his body, with the vertical stripes of tattered fabric falling downward to obscure and visually stand in for his injured right leg. The carte de visite's matte surface and mid-range tonality further reify this illusion as the folds of Kearney's trousers blend visually into those of the flag, it's difficult to tell where one ends and the other begins. In parsing this detail, it's useful to draw again from Elaine Scarry, who writes that pain becomes comprehensible in new ways when conceptualized as an entity outside of the body. And she suggests that such an action of reimagining pain can be curative. Hurt, when projection, project, projected onto an object, to paraphrase Scarry again, by its very separability from the body becomes an image that can be lifted away carrying some of the attributes of the pain with it. Here, as limb melts into flag and vice versa, the photograph, much like Lewis's plaster statuette, alludes to the place of material culture in the remaking of bodies in the wake of war. The circulation of Lewis's work during the Civil War gestures to the possibilities of sculpture to work with, but also against, dominant social, commercial, and political realities of the day. Fairs in many ways stood as manifestations of 19th century commodity culture par excellence. Marx reportedly wrote Capital's famous passages on commodity fetishism after seeing dazzling displays of goods at the Crystal Palace in 1851. But relief fairs occupied what might be best understood as an alternative economy to these spaces, for their structures to raise funds reflected and refracted mainstream practices of entrepreneurship in order to reimagine present realities. The Colored Ladies Sanitary Fair was ultimately a redressive project, one that performed an essential politics of care to unfold in response to the inequities of federal pay and support for black soldiers and their families. This vision was radical in scope as it explored the possibilities of mutual aid outside and in place of existing frameworks that unfolded apart from the nation state. Objects like Lewis's statuette of Kearney embodied these ideals in a concrete way, asking viewers to consider how single acts of making might promise generative and reparative possibilities for individual bodies and broader collectives alike. I want to conclude by turning to one final work by Lewis. In 1867, she completed one of her best known works, The Marble Group Forever Free, which depicted a young man and woman rising out of broken shackles. The three foot high marble group showed the two people, perhaps husband and wife, but also perhaps father and daughter, brother and sister, on the quote, metaphorical morning of liberty, as the artist had initially titled her work. 
The young woman rises on one knee with hands clasped, while her male counterpart stands at right, holding one arm over her shoulder, while lifting the other towards the sky with a broken manacle hanging from his wrist. They rise together, their gestures rhyming one another. And the message here is clear. They've emerged from the chains of slavery, which snake in fragments at the statue's base. In the eyes of one contemporary viewer, the statue, quote, presented a telling in the very poetry of stone, the story of the last 10 years, end quote. In 1869, Lewis traveled from her home in Rome back to Boston to present Forever Free to her friend, Reverend Leonard Grimes of the 12th Baptist Church. This dedication spoke to Lewis's place in a longstanding network of black activism in Boston, one of which she'd been a part from the outset of her career. Grimes and his spouse Octavio, who you see here, had been actively involved in wartime circles of reform, with Octavia Grimes working as one of the organizers organizers of the Colored Ladies Sanitary Commission in its 1864 fair. Scholars have persuasively understood Forever Free as a work of reclamation, as Lewis reasserts the couple as a, as a family unit in the wake of slavery's dissolution of kinship bonds. Lewis's relief work adds an additional dimension to this sculpture, one that has to do with the ways women's wartime labor participated in a project of familial and communal uplift in the age of abolition. Emancipation came after the war with the ratification of the 13th Amendment outlawing slavery and involuntary servitude in December of 1865. What this juridical emancipation would entail and what, what it might mean for people who had been enslaved at that time was unknown. The de facto and de jure structures that then would, in the late 19th century, come to forge the afterlife of slavery to call upon Saidiya Hartman's use of the term were still in flux. And whether the realm of the visual could or should make space for narratives about the end of slavery also remained uncertain. Forever Free does not present its viewers with a decisive answer, but rather suggests, with the upward motion, momentum of both figures, possibilities still unfolding. Yet the spaces of relief work from which it emerged presented one prospect wherein practices of citizenship and collectivity might take shape in the poetics of the material world. Thank you. We would love to take questions for about 15 or so minutes. Um, I wanted to make a note that for the purposes of recording, we will have microphones being passed out. So if you wouldn't mind waiting for um, one of my colleagues to pass the microphone to you. But we'd love to have questions if there are. If people are gathering their thoughts, I can go ahead and ask you a question, Caitlin. <laughs> Um, so I know that you um, address this in other parts of your work, and I know that scholars have addressed this, but I was wondering if you could expand on the mediums of um, both marble and plaster and the whiteness of those media and how, if at all, they mapped onto racial discourses of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a really good question. Um, and it's good that we have the Forever Free up here because I think that there's been a lot of really interesting work that um, also shaped my own work on the ways that the materials of sculpture in the 19th century related to ideas about race um, and particularly whiteness. And so um, in the neoclassical era when there were a lot of white marble sculptures, um, there were art writers, theorists like Winkelmann who um, thought that you know, whiteness was equivalent to ideal beauty. Um, and so sculpture became a really racialized medium because of the ways that white marble came to connote ideas of kind of um, racial hierarchies that were really kind of solidifying in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and so when bronze becomes um, sort of the, the medium to surpass marble in the middle of the 19th century in sculpture, um, it also gets called upon to do the work of sort of racial description where bronze might then connote blackness in statuary, for example. Um, and Lewis's work is interesting because she's sculpting in marble, um, plaster first and then marble. Um, and I think a lot of her work in plaster is really interesting because um, it sort of gets at kind of the, the um, 
uh, limitations that women sculptors and black women sculptors in particular faced um, in procuring sort of very expensive materials. So marble is really hard to um, procure, it's very, very pricey. Um, and so, you know, even into the 20th century, works by artists like Augusta Savage, uh, Mita Warwick Fuller, they're in plaster a lot of the times. Um, like white marble was something that, you know, oftentimes white male sculptors who had a lot of wealthy patrons were able to afford. Um, and Lewis, once she comes to Rome and she sort of establishes kind of her foothold as an artist, she sculpts in marble. And one of the things that's worth noting about her works is um, you'll notice on this statue, like kind of, it's a fairly soft looking surface. Like there aren't a lot of kind of um, really distinct details as you might see in other marble statues. Um, and her works are also quite small in scale. Like this is not life size, it's about three feet high. Um, and Lewis had fewer assistants to help carve her work um, than you know, a sculptor like Hiram Powers of the day who had you know, a whole team of Italian men helping him carve his work. So he's like a guy to do the hair and a guy to do the, you know, the, the skin and everything. But Lewis was oftentimes carving her works on her own. So I think kind of like the fact that the materials of sculpture have often been racialized extends to kind of the economy of making sculpture itself. Um, and she's carving, you know, she's producing sculpture in a fairly conservative neoclassical style, right? Where um, these figures are, you know, done in white marble. Um, and a lot of times scholars have kind of talked about the ways that the, the smaller figure um, sort of, um, she, she does not necessarily appear black um, in the way that the, the man does. Um, and it's really interesting to think about the ways that Lewis might have perhaps been um, creating sculpture that would deflect kind of the most vitriolic of racial criticism if she was to produce a sculpture of kind of a very, very realistic body of a person that then people might criticize her work more in the press um, by, you know, connecting it to racial stereotypes perhaps. And so... Um, a lot of other scholars have talked about the way she sort of used marble strategically, like this really conservative medium associated with whiteness, sort of to her own strategic ends um, in ways that were also very much accepted by kind of the a quite conservative art establishment, you know, in Italy as well as in the U.S. What other questions? Yes, Frank. Thank you so much for your talk and for being here today. I'm interested in asking you about the 19th century um, Cartevzit photographic representations of Lewis's sculptures. Um, as scholars have explored, um, Frederick Douglass, Sojourner of Truth, uh, thought deeply about photography uh, and the way in which it portrayed themselves publicly. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about what Lewis thought of these photographic um, likenesses of her uh, sculptures. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. It's, it's really interesting because Lewis um, was, from her writings, was very interested in photography. And because she worked in Italy, um, and all her friends are in the US, she would use Carte de Visite to send sort of images of her work. So there's kind of one notice where, or one instance where she had sent um, a kind of draft copy basically of Forever Free to a friend in Boston and they saw her work. Um, so she uses it to just you know, communicate what she's doing um, kind of as a tool for her own practice. Um, and then I think she also uses photography in a way kind of to sell her work, um, you know, people can only buy a sculpture if they have a lot of money or there's maybe only a hundred copies of the sculpture, but she would sell photographs of her works as well. And so there are kind of instances later on in her career where she isn't selling her sculptures, but she's selling her um, photographs of her sculptures. So it becomes a way to kind of almost further democratize sculpture and that if you can't afford a bust by Lewis, you could maybe afford a carte de visite um, and so she would kind of, whenever she would come back to the United States, she would oftentimes um, advertise the sale of both her sculptures and then pictures of her sculptures, which I think is really interesting as sort of kind of a way of promoting her work. Thanks, this is fascinating. I'm fascinated by your sources. Um, they suggest a lot of detective work. Um, how did you find the materials? Where are they from? How did you piece them together? Because you have a really wide range of fascinating sources. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, thank you. That's a, it's an interesting point because I think that like, um, oftentimes the way that Lewis's art in her life and her work gets written about is be, with people acknowledging the many archival absences that are around her life. Um, and I think that there's a great deal more to be learned about Lewis. And one of the places where I found there to be quite a bit of material was in black newspapers. Um, and so um, places like the Weekly Anglo-African or other black newspapers um, were really interested in Lewis's work. And I think she also kind of fostered links to them as well. Like she would place the advertisements in the papers and she'd go down to um, different publishing offices and sort of put her work there. And so it's in, it was really interesting to see how she sort of sought out different um, ways to um, kind of work with the black press at the time. And so that was one place where um, there were a lot of really interesting references to works also that don't exist anymore. And that's really hard to write about in art history. Um, and so you, know, you get images like these that are in various historical societies. I think these two carte de visites are at the um, American Antiquarian Society. This one's at the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, but I think, you know, there's a lot of works by Lewis that are still probably also in private collections, given the ways that, you know, they kind of circulated amongst sort of more intimate networks of friends um, and such. So I think there's, there are many kind of stones that are unturned still for future scholars. There was a question in the middle here. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, my question is about um, any uh, patronage that Lewis had. Um, you mentioned it in relation to Hiram Powers, and uh, I, I can't believe that she supported herself entirely. Um, you, can you tell us anything about how she was able to be supported through her career? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one big thing that gets her to Italy is that she sells these busts, like the busts of Shaw and then the photographs of the busts of Shaw. And so she's able to get um, money from that. Um, one of her early patrons is um, a man named Richard Greener, who was um, a black student enrolled at Harvard in the 1860s. And he actually had, there was like a notice in the Liberator where he had, um, this medallion or a plaster version of this medallion of Wendell Phillips like in his dorm room. And there was an announcement saying like it was in his dormitory. And so he, she had sort of patrons who were her contemporaries and like her friends and just sort of, uh, you know, colleagues or friends that she had. Um, and then what was the other thing I was going to mention? Oh, she also had a brother who was, he had gone out west um, in the gold rush and he ended up becoming a barber um, in Montana and he sent her a lot of money so he sort of supported her as well. So it's kind of this, um, you know, you when you're an artist you cobble together money from different sources and so it's family, it's some of it's selling works, some of it's sort of like being crafty on your own and like selling photographs of your works and such. So a mix is the answer, yeah. And. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for a fascinating talk. And one of the things that I think um, for me enlivens your talk still further is its relationship to some of the discourse um, in the accompanying exhibition, um, The Book of Two Hemispheres. And of course, a really exciting um, uh, connection between um, the presentation of Edmonia Lewis's career and the reception of Uncle Tom's Cabin is that these are things that we see unfolding on both sides of the Atlantic. And so I wondered um, if you might be able to comment a little bit on um, the way in which um, uh, subject matter, um, perhaps specific to the United States, specific to abolition, um, landed um, among um, audiences in Rome, versus in the United States, the degree to which um, Edmonia Lewis was cognizant of um, rhythms that were playing out on both sides of the Atlantic and or distinctions. Um, and then also related to that, I am curious whether she ever did anything directly in response to Uncle Tom's Cabin. Obviously, she was involved in um, addressing themes that Stowe was also in, engaged in, but just curious about those two um, questions. 
Yeah, no, thank you for that question. And now my brain is sort of trying to go through like the list of works that she does because I feel like someone recently asked me like had she done a work like a sculpture of Harriet Beecher Stowe and I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Maybe she did, maybe she didn't. But I don't know, yeah, I don't know if she did work related to like scenes or characters from Uncle Tom's Cabin. Like obviously you have like stuff from Longfellow that we see. Um, and we were talking about how artists in, um, well, viewing the exhibition, how artists, you know, Italian artists start to take up like either the subject of slavery or the subject of Native Americans, like as kind of American subjects in art. Um, and I guess one of the things that's interesting to me is about, about Lewis's work is when she's in Italy, she produces Forever Free, um, but she ultimately is destined for the US and it's destined for um, black patrons in the US. Um, and it seems that quite a bit of her work is geared towards kind of um, like sort of grand tour sculpture markets where like you, she might sculpt like a little cherub for you or like, you know, portrait, quite a few portrait busts um, or kind of kind of more small scale sentimental works. Um, and I'm curious the extent to which that, that's more market based about, you know, someone wants a cherub, they get a cherub. Um, or, and then she also became a very, very devout Catholic while she was in Italy. So she has like many sort of sculptures on very religious themes that she takes up and People have kind of talked about um, the ways that some of those themes sort of um, kind of have particular resonance um, in relation to black history and sort of uh, the histories of Af African Americans in the United States. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I would say that she has more works that deal with sort of kind of romanticized depictions of Native Americans that are coming out from Italy rather than um, kind of a topic such as Uncle Tom's Cabin. And I wonder if it is related to sort of perhaps the um, anxiety around sculpting um, black figures in her work, um, given kind of the questions of how they might be received. So when she sculpts a big Cleopatra that's at the Smithsonian that goes um, to the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition, she purposely does not sculpt Cleopatra as African looking, um, partially as a way to deflect potential um, criticism of the work that you know, is either too close to her subjectivity or that um, Cleopatra um, should not be depicted as black, so on and so forth. And so I think she sort of is kind of like <sighs> moving around that topic in really interesting ways. Yeah. Patrick? <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, Professor. I learned uh, an awful lot from this, and I feel like I sh should have known more about Edmonia Lewis coming into this. Um, my question was going to be something about about Haiti, but the conversation keeps sort of turning back to um, the question of representation. And you've referenced a few times this concern about um, the representation of black bodies. Like, how do you do that in the 19th century? How do you do that when the medium you're working in is a high art medium, uh, when your patrons, the places you go to learn how to do this are all associated with a certain kind of affluence and privilege? Um, does that sort of mean that you, I, I guess I'm just thinking about that concern she had about how you put African Americans out there in art in a way that does not invite the kinds of stereotyping that are just absolutely suffuse American culture, right? So in, in, in written work, this is like the problem of respectability, right? And so I'm, I'm, I'm curious how you reflect on that. And do you find anything that is kind of undercutting that? Or do you see her work as sort of almost wholly given over to that concern? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really interesting question um, because I keep thinking of like back to the exhibition that, um, you know, is just across the way, um, the, the print of Cinque that's in the, the show um, in the ways that that particular print, when it circulated um, of, you know, a man who led a slave rebellion on the Amistad, right? And he's pictured in this print as, you know, very sort of powerful and monumental. Um, and how when that print circulated, there were, it sort of tapped into particularly white anxieties about slave rebellions. Um, 
And whether it was the memory of the Haitian Revolution or whether it was um, more recent slave rebellions in the United States. Um, and so it, it does seem that this is something that Lewis was aware of um, and navigated. And be, being a black woman, like she was the only one. Um, so there really wasn't, um, you know, there were many women sculptors, um, comparatively speaking, but pro very few other people like Lewis. Um, and so I don't know the, the degree to which um, she is sort of creating works that are kind of just sort of deflecting um, and kind of like strategically making works that will not invite such um, kind of criticism. Um, and I think the other thing to think about with uh, Forever Free is also that Lewis is mixed race um, and she creates many, many works about indigeneity. Um, and I'm really interested, there has been like a lot of sort of discussion about the, the figure here and the way she looks sort of racially ambiguous. Um, and I'm interested in the ways that she might be, she could be, she doesn't, people always say, oh, she looks white, but like she might not be white, like she could be native. Um, she could be, um, you know, any number of sort of ethnicities and the ways that ethnicity is and is not read on the body, I think is really interesting in relationship to Lewis's work, because it does seem that she wants to kind of divest the body as a place of racial signification at some, some points. Well, I think that our conversation in this room has to conclude now, but we are happy to con continue the conversation next door over drinks and snacks in the um, museum entry pavilion. So please let, me, let us thank Caitlin again for coming in. <laughs>